Mark chapter 8 again. We're progressing ever so near to Peter's confession. Uh, this one that we just sang about. When asked, Peter says, you are the Christ. We'll get to that in verses 27 through 30 next week. I'm looking forward to that time. Great passage. Let's begin our time, though, together in God's word and prayer. Father, we come to you and we revel in how wonderful you are that we who have turned our backs on you would love us so much and have such grace and mercy towards us that you would send Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, to die a very cruel death and to pay for our sins. Or give us eyes of faith, belief, or that we would not be like these many communities that saw even Jesus' physical miracles, even brought people to him, and yet woes are pronounced upon them for their unbelief. Or even we who have accepted you as Savior at times, like the disciples, we suffer with unbelief. Or give us faith eyes to see your hand working for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage uh, immediately following feeding of 4,000, Jesus again uh, goes across the sea and he says here in verse 22, and they came to Bethsaida. Or quite literally, the town is named the House of Fish. Sounds like a really great place you want to live. They came to Bethsaida, Jesus and the disciples. And it's interesting, it says here, And some people from the town brought to him a man born blind and begged Jesus to touch him. They'd seen Jesus work, and so when Jesus comes around again, let's take the blind guy so we have to, don't have to give him uh, alms anymore so that he can live. They bring him to Jesus and beg Jesus to heal him. Verse 23 says, And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And the man, he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. No, this is not J.R.R. Tolkien. These aren't ants. His vision isn't all the way back yet. It says, Then Jesus laid, verse 25, laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Verse 26 says, Then and he, Jesus, sent this man to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village, this town of Bethsaida. Maybe you looked at this passage, you read it, thinking we would get here this week, and you thought, what in the world is going on? Here's a town, house of fish. Jesus calls it a village. It is a little smaller of a town. And yet we get another blind man. All right, Mark, can you not get any new material? We've already seen a blind man healed. What is going on? Why is this instance in here? And does it serve a purpose being juxtaposed to the healing of the deaf man in between the feeding of the 4,000, the leaven, and the Pharisees demanding the sign? Is there a progression here? Well, there is. If you noticed uh, before that in uh, chapter 8, of course, we have the feeding of the 4,000. We have the deaf man in the end of chapter 7. 
And all the while, the Pharisees keep asking for another sign, as we saw in chapter 8, starting in verse 11. And then Jesus warns the disciples about the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees. And bracketing this content are these two miracles that show Jesus is Messiah, just as we looked at with the deaf man. Go tell John! The blind see, the deaf hear, the mute speak. Here is the sign of the coming of Yahweh. It is these glorious acts. And to bracket the unbelief demonstrated throughout this passage before the great confession of Jesus as the Christ in verses 27 through 30, we get the blind men. Really, what we're doing is it's really recapping that Jesus Christ, we could say it this way for this passage, is the enlightening Messiah, the eye-opening Messiah who heals. Often, over and over again, not only in Mark's Gospel, but Matthew and Luke and John, we see Jesus healing. It's a wonder there's anyone left sick or broken in the day of Jesus in this area especially in Galilee where he spends so much of his time in between trips to Judea. How can there be anyone left maybe even in Capernaum who hasn't been touched by Jesus and healed? Because this passage, these verses from 22 to 26 are recapping that Jesus is the Messiah who heals. It's evident. It's there. I would point us back to chapter 7, verses 31 to 36. This is Jesus healing the deaf man. It says, Then he, Jesus, returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon into the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf. This should be familiar. We looked at it only a few weeks ago. This deaf man had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. Taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me, but that was a little gross. Notice Jesus, he healed, and he looking up into heaven, he sighed, and said to him, Epitha, be opened. His ears were open, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Even in our day, getting a uh, uh, cochlear implant, many people who receive their hearing still don't quite speak clearly because they're hearing through a device. Yet the healing of Jesus is so complete that this man speaks plainly. And look, Jesus charged them to tell no one. I mean, if Jesus left him mute, maybe he wouldn't have told anyone. But Jesus healed him, then told him not to tell anyone. It's like telling a little kid a secret and then telling them not to tell anyone. And we start to scratch our heads. Jesus, don't you want people to know who you are? Well, isn't there a visible walking around witness who was once deaf and mute? And yet the very next set of verses afterwards, after feeding 4,000 people, is the Pharisees demanding a sign. Really? You didn't see the deaf guy? You didn't hear him speak clearly? Jesus is the enlightening Messiah who heals. And chapter 7 tells us he heals the deaf even as the religious leaders demand a sign. How much more of a sign do you want than the deaf man who can hear and speak now? It's like some people in our own day who mock God who seek to discredit him, who seek to discredit 
creation who seek to discredit Christ. And some go as far to say, well, if God really exists, let him strike me down right now. And then when they're still alive a moment later, they say, see, God doesn't exist. They don't realize the great mercy of God who is holding back his wrath upon them. And they fail to realize the transforming power of the gospel and of God in a human being's life as witness to God and Jesus Christ as Messiah. Just like the Pharisees. If you're really the Messiah, show us another sign. It doesn't matter that we just saw the deaf guy and he can hear us. We have to whisper around him now. Jesus is the Messiah who heals. He heals the deaf, even as the religious leaders demand a sign. Back in chapter 8, here's the blind man. The people of the town, the village, Bethsaida, a house of fish, come and bring him to him, beg him, Jesus, would you heal him? He trips over the cat. He sits there and we feel guilty if we don't drop some coins in his cup as he asks for alms. Touch him. Let him be healed. Jesus takes him away from the crowd, much like he did the deaf man. He leads him out from the village and he, he spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him and he asked, do you see anything? Now I see people, but they look like trees. So Jesus lays his hands on him again, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus then charges the man who was blind to not even enter the village. Go straight home. Multiple times throughout the gospel, Jesus tells that uh, the people he heals to not stop and pass go, just go directly to home. Or go directly to the priest and show yourselves to be cleansed and allowed back into society. Why? Why would Jesus do such a thing? Well, the religious leaders are over there still asking for a sign. Show us a sign, then we'll believe. Really? You've missed all the other blind people I've healed? The deaf people I've healed? Did you miss the meal I provided you with just a few loaves and a few fish? Twice now? And what's even more sad and maybe more where we are, maybe we're not unbelieving, demanding a sign like the Pharisees, but maybe we're like the disciples. Here, Jesus, he, he heals not just the deaf man, but he heals the blind even as the disciples have just been discussing with him about bread and they haven't understood who he is yet. Jesus asked them in chapter 8, or tells them in chapter 8, verse 15, he cautioned them, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees of, the, of Herod. Matthew records the Sadducees as well. And they're over there. He's mad at us because we forgot bread. Have the disciples gotten it yet? No. Do we always get it? Do we always understand? Do we always know why something is happening? In fact, the disciples in the passage in John, which we've looked at before, asked Jesus about another blind man. Did he sin or did his parents? Jesus says, you've missed the point. He's blind so God's glory can be displayed. Jesus heals yet another person, this blind man, even as the disciples don't fully understand. And it seems that the blind man has more sight than even the disciples. In 
back in verse 22, coming to the village of Bethsaida, people bring him out, the blind man. But did you notice? Maybe you're thinking Jesus was off his game that day. Jesus laid his hands on him, spit in his eye. Do you see anything? I see people, but they look like trees. Some people would take this passage and try and say that it's up to the person's faith to be healed. That is absolutely incorrect. This is God in the flesh we're talking about who's doing the healing. Maybe you would have that argument if it was Peter or Paul or someone else later post the ascension of Christ. But this is God who, as we sing about a little while ago, with just a word, created everything that is. What's going on here? He just laid his hands on him again after he says that people look like trees. And then after Jesus did that, the man opened his eyes and he saw everything clearly. Why would Jesus have to heal in stages, as it were, from our perspective? Was it ineffective the first time? Did he not do quite enough? Does God make mistakes? That's really what we're asking, what we're charging here when we think that way. And if we are true to the Bible, we must answer with a resounding no. Don't even enter the village. What we're getting to then is Jesus is not just the enlightening Messiah who heals, but he does so on his own by his own means and his own schedule. Think back to the book of Job. God, why is this happening to me? I was righteous. God's answer to Job is, okay, you want to give me uh, counsel? You want to tell me what I should be doing? Were you there when I created Leviathan? Can you put a hook in his nose and carry him around and train him like a horse? Job's response is to throw his hand over his mouth and say, I've gone too far. Even when we discuss the centrality of prayer in our spiritual lives, in our very existence, we are often tripped up because in our finite, human, unstable minds and hearts, we think passages like, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it, and so forth, that those guarantee us God to be a genie in the bottle. And yet we read passages by people like Paul the Apostle. If anyone was going to get everything they asked for, it should be Paul after all he suffered, after all he did for Christ. And yet three times he asked God to remove the thorn in the flesh. And God's response is, this is my plan. My grace is sufficient for you. You're made more complete by weakness. And yet the, these people come out of Bethsaida. Jesus had been there before. Why hadn't he already healed this blind man? They bring him out as Jesus is coming to town. Here, heal him, finally, please. Do what we want. We treat God and Jesus the same way and are miffed when God works on his own schedule and by his own means. And this passage sits here and says, Jesus put his hands on the guy's eyes after spitting in him. Do you see anything? No, not quite. Okay. Let 
The healing was progressive. The healing was by the means of Jesus' own choosing, much like with the deaf man. He could have just said, be healed. How many different times did he look at the person making a request of him and says, your faith has made you well, or it is done as you've asked. Go home. It's taken care of. And Jesus doesn't even have to be there. Or the one with the issue of blood. The variety and even the progressive nature of the description here shows us Jesus, God, works on his own schedule by his own means. And oftentimes, it's not ours. They came to Bethsaida people brought out to him a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Reminds me of our world. When bad things happen, everybody runs to God. God, fix it! But they're not ready to welcome Jesus. There's no faith here on their part. It's just the local miracle worker a stop by, so let's drop off the blind guy so we don't have to deal with him anymore. And Jesus takes the blind man by the hand and leads him out of the village away, away from the crowd, privately dealing with him. And he spit on his eyes and he laid on his, his hands on him. Imagine even if you were blind, somebody spitting in your eyes. I have a hard enough time when the eye doctor wants to lose a little puff of air. And then Jesus asks him, do you see anything? Now, if he was really sarcastic, the blind guy would go, I'm blind, no. But he answers, I see people, but they look like trees. There, there's a shape, there's a form there, but it's not defined. And Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he opened his eyes and the sight was restored and he saw everything clearly and yet with this great miracle this one without sight now having eyes to see Jesus tells him in verse 26 do not even enter the village I don't care if your wife told you to go to the store on the way home don't go in the village get the milk tomorrow You're wondering, what in the world is going on? These people brought this man to Jesus who takes him aside, away from the crowd. And yet, Jesus tells them, don't go back. Go home. Well, Jesus is the enlightening Messiah who heals. He does it by his own means and on his own schedule. But what really is fermenting here for us is that rejecting Jesus Christ as the enlightening Messiah who heals results in severe judgment. You're asking, where in the world did you get that? Parallel passage dealing with this town of Bethsaida. In fact, we read uh, another parallel to it in Luke 10 for a scripture reading where Jesus pronounces woe Heavy judgment, something that is reserved for those who are going to face the full wrath of God. Something that is pronounced multiple times in the book of Isaiah upon different people groups because of the rejection of God. Now, Jesus says, don't even go back to the village because they don't have eyes of faith to see the work done in you. They won't believe, even though you now see. They are spiritually blind in unbelief. And as a part of the judgment, God at times like this removes the witness to his work. Notice... <clears throat> Notice... 
They've demanded a sign. The Pharisees, they haven't received it. People here bring this man. They want him healed. They know Jesus can do it, but there's no faith. There's no welcome. There's no repentance. Jesus heals the man. He spits in his eyes. He lays his hands on him. Jesus works by his own methods and on his own timetable. His sight, this man's sight is restored and Jesus prevents him, commands him to go home, commands him not to enter the village. Because when we see something like this, when we see God change a person through salvation, through the gospel, we become witnesses to it. And the act demands our acceptance of Jesus. He is the one. He is the Messiah. And if we reject him, we face severe judgment because being witnesses to the powerful working of God and Jesus demands we accept Jesus as our Messiah. This town of Bethsaida has already rejected Jesus as Messiah. So Jesus says, don't even go in. They want no part of me. So don't show them what who I am. It's much like Pharaoh in the Old Testament. How many plagues is it going to take for you to release Israel and admit their God is the one true God? Apparently 10 wasn't enough because Pharaoh grabs his army and chases after Israel and loses his entire force to the Red Sea. If you won't believe, God stops sending the sign. Because the signs demand we accept Jesus for who he is. It's much like some of the people who, as we mentioned earlier, try to discredit God and Jesus, creation and all these things. And you think, how can they be so blinded? Even just the natural sciences proclaim there is a God. There was a flood. There was severe judgment. Why can't they see it? Because they're like the people of Bethsaida. They've seen it, and they still don't believe. So Jesus and God stop sending the signs. Because the signs demand we accept Jesus for who he is. Matthew records a parallel passage about Bethsaida. Matthew 11, starting in verse 20, it says, Then he began to denounce the cities. Jesus! Oh, Jesus is all about love, isn't he? Yeah, he curses a fig tree in Jerusalem right before he's crucified, so let's just keep that in mind, shall we? Denounces the cities. This region, Capernaum, Bethsaida, all these towns and villages around the Sea of Galilee that have seen all the works he's done. He began to denounce, denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Here's the denouncing. Woe. This isn't just to get attention. This is a New Testament word that reflects even the Old Testament. This heavy judgment. This heavy judgment that has no means of escape. 
some of the peoples who received woes in the book of Isaiah are no longer. You wouldn't be able to find them if you looked other than their bones. And some remain, but soon when Jesus returns will be no longer as well. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, oh, that's right, Bethsaida. This very town, this village that brought out the blind man. And Jesus pronounces woe. Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works have been done in you, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, these Gentile, unbelieving cities have no idea, no concept of God and Yahweh. If they had seen them, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. They would have had the response of Isaiah when he sees God enthroned. I am a sinner. I'm a man of unclean lips. Woe is me. They too would have an admission and repentance of their sin, turning from it, mourning it, would have received grace and mercy like Isaiah did. God in that point sends an angel to cleanse Isaiah symbolically for what God had done for Isaiah already through Jesus in the future. If Tyre and Sidon had had these works, if they had seen a blind man healed, they would have repented long ago. Woe to you, Bethsaida. In fact, he says, but I tell you, it will be more bearable in the day of judgment when the end comes, when the wheat and the tares are separated, when the sheep and the goats are separated, when the, the tares, the goats, are sent to hellfire for all eternity. Tyre and Sidon will have an easier time than you. And you, Capernaum, my hometown where I've been staying, will you be exalted to heaven? You think you're all this because you have the Messiah staying in your town? You've seen all these people healed? No, you will be brought down to Hades to hell. For the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, that wicked city, that city filled with immorality and homosexuality, a town so grossly sinful that the, the men come to take these visitors, the angels, and defile them. Capernaum, if you had repented, but you didn't, if Sodom had seen what you've seen, it would still be here. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than Capernaum. Imagine living in this day, having seen Jesus heal so many. And then in the briefest moments of respite, Standing before the judgment of the sea of Christ, you look over and see someone from Sodom and go, how was it for you? And you compare notes and realize you got it worse. Just to be cast back in. Really what the point is, why Jesus pulled away from the town, did not heal the man there, Yes, if we're witnesses, we have to accept it. That's what's demanded of us. But failure to accept Jesus as our, as our Messiah after witnessing his great works increases our judgment. We see such things even in our own world, right? You're driving down the road. 
There's a large sagebrush in front of the speed limit sign because, let's face it, we don't have that many trees. And you don't see the speed limit sign. And you're going the previous legal allowed amount. And the man comes from behind, or the, the officer comes from behind, turns on his lights and pulls you over. And they ask you the question, did you see the sign? Well, no, honestly, I didn't. Oh, well, you're likely still to get a ticket, but you go before the judge and say, well, judge, there's a big sagebrush in the way of the sign. I couldn't see it. I have a picture here. You need to get DOT out there to fix it. The judge might just remove the ticket, right? Might show some mercy, some grace. But then they take down the sagebrush and now you're going 20 over the speed limit as you pass that sign and you meet the officer again. Did you see the sign? Oh yeah, I saw it, but I ignored it. I didn't think it was for me. You get before the judge, what is he going to do? Oh yeah, you're going to pay that ticket. You're going to get those points on your license. In fact, for your pompous attitude, I'm going to add to it. How much more with eternal things? How much more with seeing the work of God in people's lives and you still say, no, that's not for me. I don't care if it changed your life. I don't need your God. Failure to accept Jesus as our Messiah after witnessing his great works, so many things, increases our judgment. if in no other way than spending all eternity in torment knowing you had an opportunity to accept the Messiah. Let's ask some questions of ourselves. Have you, have I seen God work and yet you still don't understand because you're spiritually blind and deaf. You keep seeing it over and over again. People work, uh, people's lives being changed. God working for them. You're like, eh, that's just happenstance. That's just coincidence. They're just turning over a new leaf because you don't want to believe, you choose not to believe. Is that where you are? Or maybe you've accepted God's grace and you've seen him work for you, but now you're a bit impatient. You're a bit, shall we say, demanding. God do it on my schedule. Maybe we could say it that, this way. Are you expecting God to work on your schedule and by the means you deem best? God, you've got to do it my way. God, you're late. I expected this three weeks ago. Why haven't you done it yet, God? You know how powerful God's working is in your life and others. And you know the perfection. You know it's always just the right time, just the right way. Though you may never, you may not always see it. And yet we still sit in prayer and say, God, why isn't it done my way now? Imagine the blind man standing there going, Jesus, you messed up. I can only see people, and they look like trees. What 
Why didn't you heal me the last time you came to town, Jesus? Are you and I expecting God to work on our schedule in our way? Like the people of Bethsaida, have you rejected Jesus? Even though time and time again you're a witness to many of his works. Are you and I at risk of God's judgment? There's one way to be sure that you're not. Repent. Believe Jesus is God and trust him for your salvation. Ask him for it and he will give you. It's instantaneous applied and you never have to worry about the judgment of God correction at times but not judgment are you at risk or are you waiting the Sayada saw so many things witness the power of God to him come in the flesh and it will be easier for Gentiles and Sodomites than for them is that you only you can respond only you know in your heart if you are I implore you to ask for God's grace today. Let's bow our head and pray before we close with the hymn. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word, for even this miracle that seems just like a passing instance. Another time Jesus dealt with a blind man. And yet there's a richness here. There's a point even as a miracle before Peter would have his eyes of faith open and he would see you for who you are and even proclaim it. Where we see this whole town who have seen what you can do and they've rejected you. Lord, let us have eyes of faith. Let us see you for who you are, to accept your grace and salvation that we would not face greater judgment for our unbelief. We ask in Jesus' name.